Welcome back to another edition of Zero Blog 30. Today we have two rounds in the magazine. Round number one, I sit down with Colonel Nick Nicholas, who is a F-16 fighter pilot and has done all kinds of crazy stuff on deployments, did nine different appointments. Now he is the president of Folds of Honor, which is doing amazing things. You're going to want to hear that. He's going to teach us how planes fly. Like That's one of my, I, I never know how it which happens. Which at my age, I still don't understand. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm like, wow, Chaps is interviewing such an impressive person. Look at the shirt he's wearing. Oh. Cat dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, I didn't even think about it. That one. I'm like, yeah. Jumping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we have that. And then we also have Katie with some Memorial Day facts about AAA. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're going to figure old, out what Old Rather Lady Memorial Day facts. <laughs> Katie logged on and she was like, I got some things to say about fucking AAA. And you're going to love it. And we do. We, we're we going to love it. And you're going to love it too. I just have full faith and confidence in old Katie. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're just going to close out the weekend with some stories about what we're doing in some safe rounds. Here we go. Telemind is a mental health solution that specializes in serving our military community. With a team of experienced and compassionate clinicians, Telemind offers accessible and confidential therapy and psychiatric sessions online. Make it easier for service members, veterans, and their families to get the support they need no matter where they are. Whether it's coping with PTSD, anxiety, depression, or any, any other mental health challenge, Telemind is committed to providing military members with the resources that they need to thrive. I just messaged, in fact, it's open right now. I just messaged my provider and I said, sorry I missed your earlier email because I was doing other stuff, didn't get back. But she always reminds me, hey, you're running out of medicine. You need to get on your appointment, which I appreciate because somebody like me, I'm very forgetful. And she sends me messages all the time that we need to have another appointment. She's fantastic. You're going to find that level of care as well because Telemind has licensed and qualified clinicians who have experience work with the military and veterans. Telemind has the flexibility of scheduling options, allowing members to book at times that are convenient for them wherever they are. Take the first step on your journey. Visit Telemind.com or call 866-991-2103 to get started. Now on Zero Block 30, I'm privileged to have the CEO of Folds of Honor. Nick is with us. He's firm, former colonel, fighter pilot. So my first question, Nick, is how do planes fly? Because it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me either. I just know how to fly them. I can't build them or engineer them or tell you all of the other things surrounding how we get that thing in the air. And uh, But I focused on the most important thing was just flying the thing. So, yeah, super cool. And just for you, uh, quick correction. So I'm the president at the Folds. My oh, okay. boss, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney, is our CEO and founder. Okay. Um, so I've all, whenever I walk onto flight lines, especially like going on a deployment, I rode in the back of a C7 and a C130. And there was tanks on the inside. There was like a hundred dogs. I'm a dog handler. And I would just look around and be like, it goes against science that this thing goes in the air and flies over the ocean. Flying an F F-16, when you first get in the cockpit by yourself and you're doing it, is it like, just overwhelming that this is my job. This is what I do now. I'm a fighter pilot. Yeah. So th that was a surreal moment. So, you know, God, I, you know, I went through F-16 training about, you know, three decades ago, but when looking back on that time frame, you know, you get four, like four or five rides and what is called the F-16D, the D model. It's a, it's a two seater for a trainer. And then, you know, on that fourth or fifth ride, they turn you loose in that thing by yourself. And it was so weird um, taxing that out for the first time and kind of looking around and go, damn, uh, this is actually happening right now. You know, it was, it was very cool, uh, very surreal, very thankful that I got to do this, uh, for a living, but yeah, it was pretty impactful kind of creates, you know, one of those core memories, if you will. Oh, I'm sure. And especially with your family history, I was reading that your family generations of fire pilots, what I, I think is crazy because I know how difficult it is to get in that program. So many kids growing up want to be fighter pilots and so many in your family do it. It's almost like you guys were the fraternity version of legacy type fighter pilots, right? Yeah, well, definitely a family of blue bloods and, you know, a lot of uh, service, uh, you know, throughout my extended family and stuff like that. Yeah, so it is a super cool legacy, especially with my dad and, um, you know, Vietnam War hero, two tours in Vietnam and stuff like that. Uh, Purple Heart, Silver Star, you know, genuine badass. 
And uh, yeah, so it was super cool to be able to look back on that and then, you know, be able to carry the family name in that way. Oh, I bet it's awesome. And seeing you, one of your last rides, having the flag of your dad, I'm sure that was just an unbelievably emotional moment. Two colonels, um, then you took his flag. What was that? What was that like feeling the history there that, you know, you had completed your career and you followed in your father's footsteps? Yeah, so uh, true, it, very emotional. So that was the one and only time that my dad's uh, barrel flag had been pulled out of the case, right? And uh, it's display, displayed proudly uh, in my office uh, at my ranch. But um, it, that was there was some intentionality with that. You know, I really wanted to do it because it was kind of like in my own way, you know, being able to, uh, you know, fly with my dad mm -hmm. uh, one time, super cool. But you know, the, um, a lot of emotion around that moment, right? Because you look back and, you know, cause I lost my dad when I was 15 years old and stuff. And then be it, being able to have the career that I had very fortunate to be able to do that. But I think even more importantly was after that, after seven combat tours, after all the things, right. Being able to step out of that jet with a flag and hug my wife. It was like a big exclamation point on a career that uh, it was a, you know, a storybook, right? And uh, something super cool, super surreal, something I'm very, very thankful for. And uh, and very thankful that, you know, I got to come home and stuff when a lot of our brothers and sisters did not. Right. And I, I imagine that time of stepping out for the, of your plane for the last time, that must be difficult in any circumstances, because where are you going to find that rush. Like for me, I'm like a, searching for IEDs. There'll never be another time in my life that I feel that level of intensity, that level of responsibility for the people to my left and to my right. Stepping out of that, you'll never feel that rush of being an F-16 pilot in a combat zone again. Was that a difficult thing for you to kind of wrap your head around after 20 years of doing it? Yeah. So it's, you know, after doing it for that long and yeah, stepping away from the jet, um, you know, and kind of, you know, really stepping away from the brotherhood as well, too, because there's something unique about the jobs that both of us did that create this camaraderie and this brotherhood that you cannot duplicate anywhere else. It doesn't exist. And that's tough, right? And, you know, waking up the first day after retirement as a civilian, and uh, you feel a little bit lost, right? You know, mm -hmm. you get you just used to that rhythm of, you know, one, you wear the same thing every day, right? You don't even have to pick out your clothes. You end up like wearing that. a shirt that says cat dad on it instead of camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and stuff like that. But it's uh, it's a weird transition, you know, because I, I remember talking to my wife about it, you know, just like all of a sudden you, you spend so long doing that. And, you know, yeah, the adrenaline, the thrill of going to combat, love doing that, all the things that we did. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and it's gone you know, and, uh, and stuff, but, you know, I can look back fondly on, I still keep in touch with a lot of the bros and everything like that, but it's just different now. Right. You know, you're not in the fight anymore. You're on the sidelines now and not even really on the sidelines. You're in the stands watching and it's, uh, can be a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow, but, uh, like I said before, you know, Hey, I'm mostly in one piece and, you know, very thankful to be upright and with my family and my kids. Yeah, you talk about that brotherhood that you experience in the military across the board. We, uh, I know my, people like me that served in traditional units and not the air wing side of things. We know the officer enlisted relationship. A lot of people are interested in what it's like for you as a fighter pilot with your crew. What, are, what is that relationship like? Uh, the, the relationship is everything there. So, you know, with the guys that maintain our aircraft, they're literally the difference between life and death for us, right? You know, these, uh, you know, they are there um, before us and they're there after us, right? You know, getting the airplanes ready, fixing the airplanes that are broken, uh, making sure that we can generate air power. So, you know, and for my number one job when I was deployed is protecting that 18 year old kid on the ground with a rifle, right? We can't do that without a fabulous group of maintainers who literally work their fingers to the bone uh, to make sure that we get those aircraft airborne. So it was a very um, respectful relationship and kind of a very unique brotherhood with your crew chief, right? You know, because, you know, the last thing uh, they do, you know, as you're pulling down the chocks, getting ready to combat is give you a big salute, 
and it's just super cool. It's a neat relationship. And then when you get back, you know, getting a high five from them, especially if you came back and, you know, you had bombs on all the rails and the bombs are gone now. So, you know, you were giving them, uh, giving the enemy the business uh, during that time frame. It was always really cool to be able to share that with them. I bet. And it sounds like the the fighter pilot and the pilot in general that's dropping ordnance or doing gun runs. It's almost to me like roles are reversed, like a like on the ground, the officer and senior enlisted's job is to get the young person ready to go and do the operations, because most likely a colonel is not going to be on the ground being a pipe hitter and busting through doors. The air wing, your side doing fighter, it's completely the opposite. The enlisted folks are getting you ready to go out and do it. Once you're actually in the air in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, what is your main mission as an F-16 pilot? And how did you, like real world scenarios, what was that like? Yeah, so so my my job every time I was in Iraq or Afghanistan was close air support. Okay, so we were we were protecting, you know, you know, different types of operations, anything going on, troops in contact, we get called in uh for those type of things. But yeah, my job, like I said before, was to make sure that that 18-year-old kid on the ground came home. And every scenario was different. Like for, for me, uh, my experience is like Iraq was way different than Afghanistan. Like we were operating in the mountains a lot in Afghanistan, and that always brought, you know, a unique uh, a challenge to it, especially when it was thunderstorm season and stuff like that. Um, but the main objective there, you know, when we get on scene, number one, get your eyeballs on the friendlies. OK, number two, get your eyeballs on the enemy. And then number three, when I use this thumb, you know, we called it the pickle button to drop bombs that I was 100 percent sure where those bombs were going, that they were going on the heads of enemies and that I was doing everything I could do to keep, uh, you know, our brothers on the ground safe. And that first so, time that you do have to use your hand, is it? Does it get easier? Do you get more confident as it goes on? Because I imagine that first time you're like, oh, shit. Like when I first time I was in a firefight, I was like, I'm not sure if I'm ready for this or not. Yeah, there's a, I mean, I think every fighter pilot would tell you that there's always that a little bit of a sense of doubt and a little bit of anxiety uh, with that and stuff. But just like you guys, you know, you trust your training, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you've done this a million times in simulations and stuff like that. And you just you you trust your jet you trust the process and um and trust your abilities with all your training and stuff like that yeah but there's a little bit of pucker factor there right no, i'm sure when you're, when you're doing that the first time especially if you got guys who are danger close and those type of things and you know the last thing i would ever want on my conscience is you know being responsible for you know taking out uh one of our brothers on the ground and stuff like that fortunately that never got close to that but yeah, it's uh, if you don't take pause with that and you approach it with uh, maybe a, a level of swagger and arrogance, you probably don't have the right mindset, right? You need to approach it with a little humility and really take in the seriousness of what's about to happen. And that level of seriousness, I imagine that it, it goes through your head from the moment that you take off in a combat zone to the moment that you go. Is there any memories that stick out of your mind where you landed the plane, you got out and like, I need a non-alcoholic beer, even if that's the only thing in theater right now. Yeah, I mean, there definitely, there definitely is. I mean, I'm, you know, there's one op that stands out uh, when I was in in, uh, in Afghanistan. We're operating at, out in the uh, Helmand province, and uh, you know, supporting a uh, you know coalition group. So there were, you know, there was Brits, U.S. guys, and stuff out there, and if anybody served in Afghanistan knows that Helmand province was the main area where they were running drugs back and forth and in that type of stuff. Um, I was overhead with my wingmen and uh, we had, um, you know, the guys that we were covering down on were holed up in like this broken down building and stuff. And, you know, you know, basically right as I checked in with them, um, RPGs started hitting the building and stuff. And so, you know, the JHAC, the joint, tactical air control, the guy who calls in airstrikes and stuff obviously starts, you know, um, gets very excited on the radio and stuff like that. At this point in time, I had already sent my wingman to go get gas. I was there by myself, which wasn't atypical. We always wanted to make sure that we had, you know, one F-16 or one fighter aircraft above. Um, but the unique thing about that scenario is this JTAC that I'm talking to, you know, you know, the next words out of his mouth are, you know, we got two KIA, we got, you know, a few wounded. So this turns in, you know, from an op to a rescue mission and they're taking fire. 
So um, he can't get my eyes on the enemy. Um, I can't figure out where the RPGs are coming from or the fire. You know, they're basically getting hit from about, you know, from where they're looking about 180 degrees. Uh, but the one thing that I could do is make a bunch of damn noise. Okay. So I dropped down very low. Psychological after- deterrent. Yeah, exactly right. So at least, at least the enemy knew at that point. Okay, this fight ain't fair anymore and mm-hmm. stuff. And I, and I'm coming for you. So we we're able to, you know, um, get the suppress the fire enough that we were able to get rescue helos in there. Uh, but during this time, I'm still talking to this JTAC, and uh, ironically, his call sign was Little One, and uh, he ended up dying while I was talking to him on the radio. Wow. So, yeah. So that's the last guy I talked to. So that was, you know, that was literally uh, my second mission while I was in Afghanistan. Like I said, that's the second sortie. And, um, you know, that was, you know, the first 45 minutes of what would be, you know, six, seven hours providing air cover that day and stuff like that. But at the time, right, you know, when you're in the fight and stuff like that, you're really not processing that stuff. You're like, okay, I got to go to the next mission. You're going through your mission materials and everything. And, um, but yeah, you're right. After you land and stuff like that, the stuff starts to hit you a little bit. Um, I remember like, uh, FaceTiming my wife that night. And I still don't know that having the ability to be able to do that so easily was the best thing yeah. uh, for me while I was in theater and stuff like that. But like, like, you know, as soon as I saw her face that she knew something was up and stuff and yeah, you know, that's the stuff that, you know, you kind of carry with you. Uh, the rest of your life. And yeah, definitely would have wanted something <laughs> besides a non-alcoholic beer at that point. And stuff. But yeah, it's, uh, and again, I mean, like I said, you know, the, the toughest um, job, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan was not being a fighter pilot, man. It was you guys, you guys being on the ground in the fight right there where everything is going on, you know, seeing your brothers get shot, blown up and that type of stuff. Uh, but that, was impactful for me just because, you know, I was the last guy this JTAC ever spoke to and everything else. That's in, insanely heavy. And I understand what you're saying about um, the guys on the ground or the women on the ground that are doing that. But I imagine there's times as a fighter pilot, that's incredibly difficult because they give, do they give you an eight digit grid that you need to go to six? What do they give you? Wow. Man. All right. You're really testing my memory now. <laughs> I'm <just wanting> to- <laughs> In like five years, I don't know. It could have been an eight or a ten, ten digit grid. Um, I honestly, I I can't remember, but I do know this: that everything we did was super precise, right, mm-hmm. and, uh, and stuff. And so, you know, an eight digit grid was typically followed by a talk on the target where we're using our targeting pod, you know, to make sure that we, you know, that we were money, and make sure that we were right on. Yeah, and I, what you're saying about flying overhead and seeing people like hitting, getting on the ground. Was there ever any times that you looked down and you knew that the situation wasn't something that the F-16 could really help in because everybody was so close? I would imagine as an officer and as somebody who cares about troops, regardless of their MOS or what they're doing, that looking down and seeing the people struggling or they're in a firefight and you felt helpless, was there any times that you were like that? Yeah, you know, in you know, with the F-16, obviously, I mean, we're, we're pretty precise, uh, with what we do, um, you know, but it's not a scalpel, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you're dropping 500 pounds worth of tritonol. Okay. That's going to leave a mark on stuff. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And so, yeah, there was times I remember um, in particular in, in Iraq, I think it was there in 07 when I was there and that was during the height of the surge in Fallujah and stuff going on and getting called in on troops in contact and rolling up and, you know, seeing MRAPs and Humvees that had hit, uh, that had hit IEDs and literally flipped upside down, you know, there's guys dead inside. It's after the fact, and you're just literally watching the rescue scene going on and feeling completely helpless because, you know, they're not in contact anymore at this point. Um, they're not taking fire and you're just watching this incredibly sad scene unfold and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, and I I think I was there at the same time, just outside of Fallujah in an area called Karma. And I was on a rooftop and there was people, there's some um, people that we needed to go kill, essentially, that were in a house probably three or 400 meters away. And we were in a pretty intense fighter, uh, in a firefight. The next thing you know, they said air support's coming. And 
first an A-10 comes in and does a gun run and they're like, stand by, there's more coming. And then we saw it. We well, we heard it after the fact, after it went over, and you see that it's an F-16, and you're like, oh God, they are fucked now. And it was just, it was almost like you were in a movie in real life. Even though you're getting shot at and you're returning fire, when the planes start going overhead and you know they don't have that, and so you automatically know it's on your side, it's a morale boost like you never – I wish that the the pilots had that on like a screen, like a live feed, so you could see our reaction when we're in a very dangerous position and you see one bird come overhead and you're like, oh, we're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, and we've had several guys uh, share that type of stuff with us, which is really cool feedback, and thank you for saying that and stuff. But, yeah, I mean, it makes me feel good that – you know, just hearing us overhead gives a sense of, you know, calmness because like I said, I mean, we're in the air, we're kind of, the, we're the old guys, right. You know, and, um, and most of the guys on the ground are super young and everything else. And, you know, and sitting there, you know, some, especially my last tour in 2013, I'm like, you know, I had a 20 year old daughter at the time. I know there's, there's, you know, um, men and women out there on the battlefield that are my daughter's age, you know, so you take that very, very uh, seriously, but yeah, to go in there and, you know, the greatest thing was being able to go in, get everybody out, um, do the job. And, and at least for that day, um, everybody got to go home. Right. And that was, uh, super special. That's a good day. And going yeah. from that line of work where you're doing combat operations, seven different deployments, looking at some horrific things, I would imagine, from the cockpit of your plane. And then you come out and you retire and you start doing what you're doing now and helping people through Folds of Honor. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about how you got into it and what you're most proud of of the organization? Yeah, I can do that. So our CEO and founder, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney, and I flew F-16s together. That's where we met. In fact, he flew his very first combat sortie on my wing several years ago. I think it was 2002-ish time frame, something like that. And um, and so we got, you know, re you know we stayed connected through the years. He obviously started the foundation. And so, you know, approaching my retirement in 2018, we really started talking. He goes, hey, why don't you come work for us? You know, I think you can be a force multiplier. And, uh, you know, especially with my background story with my dad and and then, um, and then my service throughout the years, um, made, it was a natural fit. And it was actually a really good landing place for me because it was a place where I could continue to serve, right? Continue to give back, be thankful every day that, you know, I'm still above ground and, and take care of these, uh, take care of these military families. Um, what I'm most proud of with the organization is this. When you talk to our recipient families, obviously, they're very thankful for the educational support. School has not gotten any cheaper. You're getting ready to send a kid over to college. You're going to be very familiar with this. And uh, I was actually looking at it with my kid this morning. I'm like, $400 a, a credit hour? Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like that, It's just so it's, much. It's it's insane, right? And, um, you know, so they're obviously thankful for the educational support, helping them achieve their dreams and stuff like that. But most importantly, they're so thankful for the fact that thank you for um, that. We're still heard, you know, thankful for remembering my mom and dad, being able to tell their stories and share these things, hopefully in perpetuity. Right. So this country doesn't forget, man, freedom ain't free. It was a hard fought battle. We didn't wake up one day and have a democracy and freedom and capitalism and all these other things. It was bought on the backs of men who were willing to go die for something that they believed in. And um, that is really, really cool. And in fact, I'll be in St. Louis later today uh, with one of our gold star spouses and stuff um, who lost uh, her husband in a uh in an i with an ied and uh super powerful story and stuff like that but just being able to be around them and her to have an audience of six or seven hundred people to share the story of her hero husband is uh that gets me excited it makes oh, me proud and i'm sure that that is incredibly fulfilling but at the same time being in an organization like yours and the people that you're serving have all gone through horrific stories. And I'm sure when you meet people constantly that you hear these horrific stories of loved ones, they're people that are closest to them in their hearts that are gone and that they'll never be able to see them again. 
does that weigh on you in an emotional level where it's sometimes that's hard for you to hear over and over again every day? I don't know that. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, you'd have to be dead inside for to not, you know, for that not to be impactful and and emotional. Um, but the neat thing for me is like, uh, especially with the kids, to be able to connect with them because I'm like, I was them. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And so you have this kind of uh, neat connection. You become part of this, you know, gold star family club that nobody wants to be a member of. And so it, there's a sense of uh, peace with that in a, in a very weird way, because you're like, okay, somebody who actually kind of gets what I went through. Right. And then, you know, now as somebody who's retired from the military in my fifties to be a, um, a mentor and somebody these kids can come to and stuff like that is, is really cool. So yeah, stories, super hard to hear. Um, hate that they went through this, but love the fact that I can connect with them in a very real and very personal way. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I told you before we started recording that I'm looking into the process and preparing for, to interview. I, there's things that I didn't know, like kids that like mine, I have a hundred percent disability from the VA purple heart recipient would qualify for your program. And I thought looking at it this morning and last night, I mean, legitimately, I know that's going to seem like a lie, but last night we were sitting, my wife is much more intelligent than I am. And she had the three different spreadsheet for my kid to stay here and to work a little bit, go to college here or go to Chicago with us. And we did all the budgets and she was just looking at colleges here and without scholarships, we looked at it. She'd be in the hole about $1,800 a month with her budget. And then we started looking into scholarships and I was like, well, this organization does all kinds of things for um, gold star families and people like us, but I don't know if it's something that fits us specifically. Can you talk us through what it's like to apply for that? Because I know that there's a lot of people that are in my same situation that listen to this show. If you were going to recommend that they seek out your organization, how would they do that? Yeah. So uh, first of all, go to foldsofhonor.org. Everything you would want to know is on there. There's a scholarship section on there and it details out how to qualify. So if you're a in the military, military veteran, um, and you have a VA disability rating, okay, or uh, worst case scenario, uh, you've lost your loved one, okay, you qualify for Folds of Honor scholarships, okay? And our goal each and every year, in fact, we just closed our scholarship window at the end of March, we had 12,500 applications, wow. which is, which is unbelievable. Um, and we want to take care of all of them, right? So yes, you as a veteran with 100% disability rating, Purple Heart would 100% qualify um, and get funded um, by our scholarships. Uh, so anybody out there, again, foldsofhonor.org, click on that scholarship tab, and it'll give you all the information you need. If you still have questions, there's an email link on there. It will go to my team in our scholarship section, and they will get back with you within 72 hours with an answer. Wow, 72 hours. That's is that the directive from the colonel? Is that is that you put your colonel hat back on? Yeah, yeah. So communication is key, <laughs> right? You know, and um we want to make sure that these families feel heard and loved when they contact our organization. Uh each and every day when I wake up, they are our why. Okay. They're why we get up every day, they're why we come to work, they're why we have an organization. And yeah, if you have questions, we're going to do whatever it takes. If we need to get you on the phone, on a Teams call, through email, whatever works best for you, we're going to make sure we get your questions answered and get you taken care of. And if people want to donate to the organization, can they do that from the website too? 100%. So foldsofhonor.org. Okay. So we ask people to join what's called our squadron. That's our affinity group. It's 13 bucks a month. A lot of and people go, some well, air wingers there, the squadron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you got two fighter pilots at the top. So you know, come up with a squadron, right? And, um, and people ask, you know, Hey, why $13? Because this flag right here, this iconic triangle shape of freedom, um, it takes exactly 13 folds to bring it to that 13 bucks a month. That's probably uh, less than what you spent at Starbucks this morning. Uh, get in a fight with us, help us take care of these families. Uh, and it would be very much appreciated. Again, foldsofhonor.org, click on that squadron tab or the donate tab at the upper right-hand corner and, uh, and you can join us. And I'm going to make the commitment to do that. As soon as we get off with, we're done here, I'm going to do that. And we're going to encourage our listeners to do that as well, because I think it's a great organization. And there's, there's so many organizations that are designed for the warfighter that 
for Green Berets, for Navy SEALs, for infantry folks. The fact that it's for the kids, I think sometimes the kids get left behind, uh, that they miss their family member, they miss their dad, they miss their mom, and they will never have that relationship again. So having someone come in and be like, this is what your parent did, and we appreciate it so much that we want to set you up for success. And that's exactly what you're doing by helping pay for college. You're essentially setting themselves up where they're not going to be destitute, where they're going to have good quality jobs and do all those things. I think it's an incredible organization. Well, thank you. And, you know, and our mission is to honor the sacrifice, educate the legacy. Okay. And that's exactly what we're doing. And this isn't a handout. This is a thank you. Okay. Your family has been through a lot like, you know, and you could probably say the same thing about your family. You know, my wife and my three kids, they didn't sign on the dotted line like we did, right? They were just along for the ride. And neither one of us probably ever asked if it was okay, but it just always was. And so to be able to give back to these families in a very real way, say, hey, you were in the fight too. You're the ones that say goodbye to your, you know, to your mom or your dad, and they potentially never came home. And then to have that, you know, sort of that, you know, blanket of freedom wrapped around them in a very practical way, education, okay, and help them give, you know, a little bit of a leg up in life and stuff and give them a fighting chance. Well, that's, a, that's a wonderful way to close it out. Nick, thank you so much for joining us again. Go to foldsofhonor.com and make sure that you're signing up. $13 a month for most of you ain't shit. So go on and do that and help somebody out. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. There's nothing like a little bit of Omaha steaks to get the old mouth water in my friends. And with Fa Father's Day coming around the corner, the Father's Day experts at Omaha Steaks have made it easy to put a smile on the big guy's face this summer with hand-selected packages. Packages can include fork tender, bacon wrap filet mignon with other gr uh, gourmet grillables like the air-chilled boneless chicken breast, burgers, jumbo, franks, and many more favorites. Don't forget to save room for the dessert. Most gift packages come with four delicious caramel apple tartlets. I am getting hungry just thinking about it. And with Omaha Steaks, you're giving a gift to the world's best beef. Not only are steaks naturally aged for ultimate tenderness, juiciness, and flavor, but Omaha Steaks is five generations of family-owned expertise. That means you have uncompromising quality you can trust. This Father's Day, show him the love that the only gift that's unforgettable as he is the mouth-watering perfection of Omaha Steaks from perfectly aged, oh, so tender steaks to hand-packaged select gift packages. Omaha Steaks make it easy to give dad what he really wants. Order today to get $30 off with the promo code ZERO, and every purchase is backed by their unconditional 100% money-back guarantee. Minimum order may be required. See the site for details. It's omahasteaks.com. Again, promo code ZERO. All right, it's going to be a long weekend, so before we get into save rounds and alibis, Catherine had some good advice. It's a little bit of a safety brief. What do we got, Catherine? I just have the Memorial Day weekend travel update. Okay. I got I Love got the it. traffic reports Send for you. It. I got everything. And first of all, and most importantly, a friendly reminder, this weekend's not about having a good time. So That's shame right. on you mm -hmm. if you had something fun planned. Shame mm -hmm. on you. Uh, or no, even but every... if you smile. Seriously. <laughs> but this, this if you're not sitting alone in your home thinking about all the sacrifices that were made for mm -hmm. you to be here today, Shame on you. If you're not acting Poor like shame. long time stoolie Noah and sitting in a pile of your own excrement and ripping your clothes off and lamenting with ashes on your face, get out of town. <laughs> I like to do a healthy mix of both. I usually do cry every Memorial Day. I do get in my feelings and mm -hmm. I do I do reach out to my friends this year. I can't have a couple drinks and reach out to them and be like, Yeah, yeah you're fine. What's going on? It seems but like yeah, somebody yeah. hasn't watched Mad Men. <laughs> Yeah. True, you're right. Maybe I'll go Mad Men on the old. But anyways, um, I like to do a healthy mix of both, a nice mix of both. Because they'd want us. Our buddies exactly. would, truly. Exactly. They yeah, 100% would. Yeah. I I imagine they're, them the extra magic hands holding up my legs at the keg stand. <laughs> anyway, that was a weird thing to say. No, it's fine. Yeah, okay. It's keep going, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All you're right. on a roll. Anyway, AAA every year. Shout out to my mom and dad. That's their big Christmas gift to me every year. A jug of windshield wiper fluid and a AAA membership. I mean, that's good. What else could you possibly want? 
I used to Isn't lock it? myself out of the car all the time. Comes in handy. Tell you what, it's interesting what you get jazzed about as you get older, because that's a legitimately good gift. That's a good gift. I know. I <laughs> yeah. know. I get super pumped about it. Anyway, every year they have been tracking this for a hot minute now, how many people travel over Memorial Day weekend, because it is it is the kickoff to summer. And so this year they're projecting 42.3 million Americans are going to be going 50 miles or more from home this weekend. That's a 7% increase from last year um, and 2.7 more, 2.7 million more people than the previous year are going to be traveling. Why do you guys think a big reason for that might be? Uh, COVID's over. One and two, gas last Memorial Day weekend was over $4 a gallon. Oh, wow. Well, that's good that we're trending back in the better direction for gas prices. Yes, this is expected to be the third busiest Memorial Day weekend since the we're year like 2000. We're like the oldest podcast of all time. <laughs> yeah, like, we're AAA is AAA gas Look prices. Look at these gas prices. This the weather is, is going to be amazing. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to try my we new gotta Bella We got to stop mold. saying we're a podcast for active duty members. We're not. We're a no, podcast we're for old, old veterans. We're for the um, olds. <laughs> but if you are active duty, so glad yeah, you're Yeah, we here. appreciate it. Yeah. Enjoy Enjoy sitting around old, with the old, nurse old. at home, learning from our wisdom. I do. I have a couple <laughs> to make it even older. I have a couple facts about Memorial Day weekend. Let's go. And ready to go. Love it. it. It used to be called Decoration Day following the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And it didn't become an official federal holiday until 1971. I thought it was older than that. Yeah, I, I did too. Like too. I absolutely would have thought it was much older. Also, so after the Civil War, General John A. Logan, he. Uh, he called for a holiday commemorating the fallen soldiers to be observed every May 30th. But the Uniform Monday Holiday Act in 1971 took place where they were like, no, no, we don't want it on every May 30th. We want it to always be on a Monday so that you get a long weekend. Hell yeah, brother. Because we want this weekend to be so special. And I, I'm like, hell fucking So yeah. thoughtful. But listen to this. This was counterintuitive to me. Some groups like the Veterans Organizations, the American Legion have been working to make it May 30th again always because they want they say like it's it's more proper that way. I say no no no. Boo. Boo. Keep it Monday. We need that Monday off. Right. And Great if way you to kick change off the it, summer. It's got to be a Friday. Yes. Yeah. Seriously. And I think people if you take away Memorial Day weekend people are going to get mad at the troops. Oh, yes. People will be mad at, no matter what yeah. the sacrifice. <laughs> people are going to be pissed. And we're going through it out. right now with the wars over. So <laughs> um, I, d- I didn't know this. In December of 2000, Congress passed a law requiring Americans to pause at 3 p.m. local time on Memorial Day to remember and honor the fallen. A law? So if you're out. A law. I had no idea. Um, it doesn't appear to be. What are you in knowledge. for? Well, I didn't stand there. <laughs> they caught me on my bicycle at yeah. 3 301 p.m. I didn't know. Um, and then finally, I just. Arlington National Cemetery, you've both been, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Because you were at 8th and, and um, To me, it's one of the most powerful places I've ever visited. Mm-hmm. And it really is. People go to D.C. and I remember when I was a kid, my parents took me to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And I was a kid. I didn't get mm-hmm. it. I was like, it's 1,000 degrees out here. What do we do? I had like an attitude. Yes. I was like a piece oh, of absolutely. shit about it. Yeah. Um, but then I went back as an adult and spent an entire day there. It's like over 600 acres. You can yeah. spend an entire day. And I was just so moved by every single section, every single thing. Um, three million visitors a year, 624 acres of land, and they do 25 burials a day. Wow. Uh, wow, I didn't know that. No, me either. The first person ever buried there was a private. Uh, I didn't know that either. Two, Lincoln's son and grandson are buried there. There's a lot of really interesting. Mm. You could just spend an entire day, and it's just fascinating. Something I also didn't know, there are almost 4,000 former slaves buried in Section 27, a land that used to be known as Freedman's Village, Arlington's first free neighborhood. I had no idea somehow when I was doing the tour of that. But anyways, those are my thoughts on Memorial Day. Reach out to your buddies for the love. I know we'll say it again at the end of the show, but it's a big weekend for me. I don't really, I kind of fall off in keeping touch with people, but this time every year I always get the itch to be like, I got to check in on my buddies. And, Mm -hmm. And it feels good when they check in on me too. And reaching out to the parents Mm. of my fallen friends has become a thing for me every year that I think it matters a lot to the parents and the yeah. family members to hear. It's a great point. Too. Um, so if, you know, if you're on the fence and, oh, it might be weird if I do that, I say do it. But anyway, that's Katie Memorial Day. 
All right. All right. Let's move into Nailed some it. safe rounds and <laughs> alibis. We won't start with you, Kate. We'll let you get your bearings back. Thank we'll start you. with you, Connor. What do you got? Okay. So uh, today, as we record, it is my parents' 41st wedding anniversary. And as somebody who just celebrated a little while ago my first anniversary, I don't know where dude, the heck 40 years will come. Dude. Yeah, seriously. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. So shout out to them. Um, and then also, I'd be remiss just because I, you know, I talk about how to dress and whatnot. I was just really perturbed by seeing Senator Fetterman in sweats. And I made a joke about it on Twitter, like, oh, I guess he thought it was a Zoom meeting. But for me, I, and maybe this is too idealistic. I love this. I still hold those offices up in high regard, and I think you should respect them. And there is an actual dress code. So for him to be wearing sweats... I think it's disrespectful. You're there to do a professional job and you should be dressed as such. I understand he's getting over some some mental health issues and I respect that. But if you're going to go back to work, you need to dress properly. And to the people who are like, well, I like how he dresses because it makes him more relatable. Uh, no, sorry. I, you can be a relatable. And you this know is, what he needs? He needs what? a queer eye episode. Oh, Seriously, <laughs> they need to fix that man. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. many queer eye for the like Capitol Hill would be incredible. Oh man, so many of them dress just so so poorly. But uh, the I George just Santos get Diane yeah. Einstein a little napkin to wipe the drool from her lip. <laughs> yeah, and this isn't Trip even keeper. political. Because when when he's dressed like that, it totally takes away and is distracting. I have no idea what he was talking about that day because I was focused on what he was wearing. So I, I would just well, like if he dressed properly when on the floor of the Senate. Seeing him remind me, I, obviously, we all know I'm divorced now, but I had a very big, <laughs> fancy-ass Catholic wedding with like 350 people. Oh, wow. Did you really? I didn't know I that. I didn't know that. Oh, are you fucking kidding me? We didn't 350? Know that. I did not know that. made the divorce so bad. I was like, sorry, mom and dad, that you spent so much money. You gotta money write on 350 that. apology notes. Oh my <laughs> gosh. I got so many gifts that are just sitting in, I don't know, so much crystal wear. Anyways, um, where crystal wear Katie is what they call it. It was a very <laughs> fancy wedding, though. It was like a formal ass, huge, massive fucking wedding. And communion in the Catholic Church is like, Easter Sunday, weddings, it's a fashion show, baby. Everybody's looking at you in the line. What are you wearing? Who you got on? Blah, blah, blah. And everyone, I'm sitting there in my wedding dress, and I'm looking at everyone's dressed so nicely. And then a guy we had invited to the wedding, I had to do a double take. I was like, what? What is that? He wore basketball shorts and a cutoff T-shirt. Right. And, and weren't you annoyed? Like, you get the like, fuck. See, that's why like, you, need, you needed a company gunny back. at your wedding, Kate. Seriously. I, I was like, I had, and I had like high, my master gunnery sergeant. There. I had like people from the military there who had dressed to the nines, who had traveled from so far. Wow. And this motherfucker rolled up. In Can't have that. Basketball shorts. And yeah. he looked totally confident. I said, you need to be taken down a path. What rank no. are you at the time? Yes. Corporal? I was, I was, uh, they brought my higher ranking people that I invited probably looked around and was like this fucking Lance Corporal thing. No, dude, I totally disagree. If, if you are a Lance Corporal or a Corporal or below and your leadership goes across the country to go to your wedding, all the shit talk, all the, I was a shit bag, all of that. Uh, Katie doesn't know military stuff gone. Absolutely. Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah. Kate. If they flew That's across true. the country, you were shit hot, not the other way around. Well, I would have never, leaders. never done that. And the no, but even the best leaders. leaders. I loved my leadership. I loved them, so I was like, even so the best leaders, everything. you had to have done something to mm-hmm. impress upon them enough that they made that effort. I think. Mm-hmm. Well, anyways, basketball shorts. Uh, so, yeah. Nice. So anyway, it's it's, a, it's a serious job. You have there are certain jobs in this country still that you need to dress for the job, and Senator Fetterman needs to dress for the job. He needs to stop this this nonsense with the hoodies and sweats. I'm sorry. I totally agree, Cons. I totally agree. And it, if you want to dress down, I could say you could dress down. Like, you don't have to wear a suit and tie every day. If you came in with some trousers and, like, a button-up shirt and a, a tie, I'm totally fine with that. To go in looking like you're heading to the laundromat is insanity. Yeah. Like that's yeah. tough. And I think even more so if you're coming back from a leave of absence, you have to show up and say, I'm ready to be back yes. on the job. 
Like, if yes. you're not ready to be back on the job, don't do it. Same thing with then Dianne Feinstein. Then take the Feinstein. time and stay away. Yes. Like, everybody's talking about George Santos being out of Congress, which they should, and he should be. But Dianne Feinstein said this week she, did, she wasn't gone, that she was in D.C. the entire time. She was gone for months, and yeah. she didn't even realize it because she's 89 fucking years old. Stop she electing these retire. old fucks, please. Seriously. Seriously. Anyway, anyway that's all anything I else? <laughs> yeah, that's all I got. got that off our chest. He's that's sorry. Fucking I had to get old, it off my man. chest. They're ruining Flattering everything. Me. See, I mean, of course Biden can't negotiate. Of course people in Congress, because they're all goddamn old. All of yeah. them. Sick of these anyway. people. Any- all right, Kate, what do you got? Uh, gosh, nothing in particular. I am heading down to Myrtle Beach area mm. for the next uh, tomorrow through Memorial Day weekend. Pat's family, they normally don't do, my family does the big Jersey Shore vacation every year. They normally don't do like a big beach gathering or whatever. So this is, they're dipping their toe in the beach week pond. And as a, I'm like a high ranking in this world, they're noobs, they're the boots here. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see how this goes, but I'm looking forward to it. Cash buddy down the shore, he's a beach guy. So I'm pumped and I'm just looking forward to spending some family time. How's you feel about sandcastles? Fucking loves them. Loves stomping on them, loves digging them, loves whatever. Uh, but also, I've never gone down the shore down there before. The s- That's not the shore. South? No, no, no. We oh. The shore is just in Jersey. We're not saying the, sh- yeah. the shore does not exist outside of Jersey. Mm-hmm. You're going mm-hmm. to a beach town. That's fine to say. Yeah. But the shore well, is Jersey and Jersey concerned. alone. It's not Myrtle Beach. We're like on an island like further north. Am I going to be able to get like a pork roll, egg, and cheese or in no. the No. Am I going to be able to get my coffee and, and not Boston cream, the white cream? Maybe. Donuts? I don't know about, but I, I can Wait, tell you right now. You're not you want the frosting fried? instead of the pudding? <laughs> Anybody who likes the pudding, I'm sorry. I'm Trash. a big pudding You're guy. You're low class. I know you are. <laughs> yeah. I know you are. Um, but anyway, I'm I, I'm, I have a lot of concerns. Guy. I'm looking forward to it, but I also have a lot of concerns. So. You can't All right, get a let's good do a notice. quick power rank and pudding flavors. Uh, just the top three. What do you got? We'll start with you, Cons. Uh, chocolate, butterscotch, vanilla. Excellent choices, Kate. You know what? Chocolate, butterscotch, chocolate. Okay, I'm going to go all three vanilla. I love, I'm love. i not usually a vanilla guy, but that shit fucking slaps. Anything else, Kate? I got one more thing. This okay. this weekend... Pudding I, related I, or no? Two, okay, I have two things. Okay. One, <laughs> this weekend I dragged the family to the New Jersey State Renaissance mm, Fair mm-hmm. down in South Jersey. It was raining. It was muddy. It didn't stop these people. These people should all be in the military. Because they... <laughs> they might have been. I'll tell you this, too. And I'm not ripping on them. Because I, I go to Renaissance Fair. Like, I, I don't dress up. But these are kind of my vibe of people. Like, just nerds. A lot of body odor. <laughs> and this they are the horniest, oh, horniest time. group of people I have ever encountered in my life. And I've been in enough Renaissance Fairs now to say it. It's like cosplay for horny Dungeons and Dragons people. Mm -hmm. All the titties are out. And ladies, if you're like me and you're like a dark bar six, you can clean up at these things. Put on a corset and go, honey. Where can ladies not clean up? I mean, if you're a woman with a vagina and you walk into a bar and you put your hand up and say, I'm looking to fuck, there's going to be like a cacophony of dudes that show up ready to do it. I'm just saying, if you're like old Snaggletooth Kate, one of my rougher days, I could go there and like really make a killing. Um, there's just all sorts of, just it's a unique, all the unique people come out and I enjoy things like that. Then also, um, yesterday I took my son to the highest point in New Jersey. I'm knocking off all our Jersey bucket list while we've been have there. High Point State Park, yep. giant obelisk. We get up there and Cash is super into motorcycles right now. What came rolling up for a big memorial service at the giant High Point Obelisk ahead of Memorial Day weekend? A massive veterans motorcycle group. That's the nice came... motorcycle. <laughs> Cash, we were walking they through the woods. They got motorcycles he... at the obelisk. Okay. We were walking through the woods coming out of this little trail that we were on, and you could hear them. And we came out of the woods, and they were all pulling up, and he screamed, the highest pitch screamed, and just said, awesome. Aww, he was so pumped. That's and so then all cute. the veterans could see how pumped he was. So they were like, he can sit on him if he wants. He oh, can. N- nice. They let him walk around and touch all the motor. They let him, like, all was the Was Death Trap there or no? 
No, and he has a new old lady now. Oh, so damn. We're, we're done. Um, but they were just so nice, super nice. And then we got up to the obelisk right as a little memorial ceremony was starting. So we got to, I got to get my Memorial Day weekend uh, moment of remembrance in. But it was just really neat. The the veterans were just so nice, letting us hang out with the mode, the motorcycles. So that was a long random. Okay. No, that's okay. great. I, I love it. <laughs> Okay. When the kids have fun, it's great. Speaking of which, yeah. Cardi is in D.C. right now doing a little event where it's like a dress-up event, and it's a formal event for a bunch of kids. And it is – they look so cute, man, like this yeah. morning. And it's awesome. Like, as your kids get older, when they know they look cute, mm. it's the best feeling. Like, when they walk yeah. out of their room – because you remember what that's like for picture day or whatever, for Easter Sunday, and you just know you look good. There's nothing like that. And Cardi had that in spades. Fresh new little mohawk, faux hawk thing. It was awesome this morning. Also, we went to Chicago last week to look for some houses. We have an offer out. Who knows if it'll get accepted. I keep looking at my phone to see if I have a text from my realtor or not. I'm excited about that. But Chicago, I fucking love it, man. Like coming from up here or down here mm. and it's constantly hot. I was walking around at nighttime, a nice little 65 degree, 60 degree little chill in the air. Unbelievable. Yeah, that just, were... you just don't really get that in Texas. No, never. So that's like legit late winter weather here. I, and mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't wait for it. The house that we're looking at is in a fantastic area. Everybody where we were at, speaking of Dungeon and the Dragons, we went to a little uh, farmer's market in the area that we're looking at. I go up to this these people were beekeepers and I'm going up there cause you know, I'm a honey guy. And I go, <laughs> try, I try some of uh, the yeah. honey there. And this dude walks up to me and he's like, Hey, you ever played dungeon and dragons? And I was like, no. And he's like, you should look into it, man. It's pretty awesome. Just he the just, first he just thought it. by the way you looked. <laughs> just first thing he said. Yeah. Do I give up? Uh, that's why I do. I yeah. give you up. Absolutely. Yes. Do. I do. Yes. You absolutely okay. do. Yes. All right. 100%. I was looking for you at the Renaissance Fair, honestly. I was like, Caps has got to be here somewhere. Well, you, know, the Druid you know how much I love an elephant ear. Can't get enough of them. That and vanilla pudding. That's what I like. Mm-hmm. I, sometimes I like to dip my elephant ear into a little bit of banana pudding. So. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And when I came home, there's nothing like coming home when you have a little puppy or like mm. Baby Dale. Baby Dale Zoomies, when I came home after like four or five days, were out of control and it was he licked me so fast that i don't know how his tongue moved that fast it was amazing so i felt great coming home i'm looking forward to finding out when i'm gonna move i guess that's that's exciting and the v the va loan thing i got it unlocked now i feel like i'm ready to go i could teach a class on it because i've learned so much over the last couple times uh last couple weeks even more so than i did before Anyways, it's good. <laughs> no, don't just sound that we got to say one more thing. About okay, go Memorial ahead. Memorial Day. I just, just sending love and thinking to everybody who has a tough time this weekend. Sending love thinking of everybody who has a grandma, a grandpa, somebody mm-hmm. that they're missing this weekend, an aunt, uncle, brother, sister. Um, it really is. Like, I struggle every year still. I, I have a tough time every year. Um, but it also is important to sit and reflect. Life gets busy and you sit and think. Um, much love to everybody. I was walking down my street the other day and they had high school students. Our town puts out, you can submit if you're a veteran or veteran family member, a little flag with their face and where they served and mm-hmm. what they did. Yeah, and those are all over. over. They're all over New Jersey. All, a lot of towns do those. I know what and you're talking about. there was a high about. school class going around and the teachers, I guess, had gotten info from the families and were stopping at each one and teaching them about that oh, veteran I, I, and that's awesome. World War II and whatever. And the students were like fully engaged with it and asking questions and like, whatever i had just dropped my son off at daycare and i'm, I'm sitting there eating a donut and the teacher was like and this says he was an e4 i'm not sure what that means i'm like it means he was a <laughs> <laughs> like, scurried off with my donut <laughs> um, but I, I remember at woodlawn um, i've done different years putting the flags on the st- gravestones and stuff like that but um i just just thinking of everybody it is uh it's, yeah can be a it's hard weekend, i think and- to just get wrapped up and and everybody always has plans and it's usually a very busy weekend from that regard and I'm not telling anybody what they have to do, but you know, don't be afraid to just excuse yourself from the plans at any point from your friends and family and just say, hey, I'm going to take a little time to myself. I, I think that's perfectly acceptable. And ticket anyone moving at 3 p.m. Exactly yes, thank right, you. Kate. Please. Thank you for that reminder. Yeah. And if you want us to shout out any of your um, relatives or any of your friends that have passed, 
um, send them to us. DM them at zero block thirty, and we'll put those up like we have in the years past. And it's even for the people getting posted, it's great to have that remembrance. But I enjoy like going through, not enjoy, but I appreciate I going through mean. and reading the stories and hearing how much they have impacted these people because it's important. Like it doesn't just go away whenever the first anniversary or second. It's it's a lifelong commitment to keep these people's memories fresh um, there. So I, I completely agree. And thanks for stopping me there, Kate. Um, other than that, safe sex is great sex. You better wear a latex because you don't want that latex that I think I'm latex. So wrap it up. Well, yeah, exactly right, Kate. Kate just showed off the old Bellaroon. That's what they call it. <laughs> it was another surprise. So, Ooh. so I, I appreciate that all these are going to be documented. So every time Kate has a baby, she, <laughs> the Kate can go back and be like, surprise. well. Because <laughs> everybody used to like, no, you were totally playing. I wanted to have a baby when I was 48 years yeah, old. I wanted yeah. to. <laughs> no, this is cool. Of course. That's how nice. I drew it up. Yeah, yeah. Got a yeah. lot of gray hair. Mm-hmm. So. Old time mm-hmm. ass baby. Sound the retreat.